In the early days of September 1862, General Robert E. Lee, commanding the Confederate Army in Northern Virginia, leads his men across the Potomac River into the state of Maryland in an audacious invasion of the North. When the 54-year-old Virginian had assumed command of the Confederate armies around Richmond just three months earlier on June 2nd, the fledgling Confederacy had seemed to be on the verge of collapse. Now, as the summer campaigning season of 1862 comes close to an end, what had been perceived as improbable at the start of the year was rapidly becoming more and more likely. The Union could be on the verge of losing the war. The new year of 1862 had started off very promising for the Northern War efforts. In the Western theater, particularly, Southern efforts to make gains in the region had been curbed at every corner. A Confederate invasion of Eastern Kentucky in the early weeks of the year was repulsed by George H. Thomas at the Battle Mill Springs on January 19th. This helped secure the Union's hold over the key border state. Just weeks later, federal forces under Ulysses S. Grant and Andrew H. Foote had succeeded in capturing Forts Henry and Donelson, allowing the Union to gain complete control of the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers. The South's strategically important industrial cities of Nashville, Tennessee and New Orleans, Louisiana soon fell into northern hands as well. In early April, Federal forces under the overall command of Grant won an important victory at the Battle of Shiloh in southwest Tennessee, resulting in the death of General Albert Sidney Johnston, commanding Confederate forces in the whole theater. Grant and his superior, Henry Halleck, then moved on to capture the vital rail junction at Corinth, Mississippi after a month's siege. Success for the Union War effort in the early spring of 1862 was not just limited to the war's western theater. An expeditionary force led by Major General Ambrose Burnside helped secure the coastline of North Carolina, capturing all the major ports except Wilmington. In Virginia, Major General George B. McClellan's massive Army of the Potomac moved up the Virginia Peninsula and onward towards Richmond. These were indeed dark days for the Confederacy, but the tide soon changed. At the Battle of Seven Pines or Fair Oaks from May 31st to June 1st, a critical event in the war occurred when Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston was wounded, requiring replacement as the head of the army around Richmond. After assuming command of the reorganized Army in Northern Virginia from Johnston on June 2nd, General Robert E. Lee wasted little time in seizing the initiative. An audacious commander, ever willing to assume bold risk, Lee led his outnumbered army in one attack after the next during a week-long series of engagements known as the Seven Days Battles. By the end of the first week of July, Lee's men succeeded in thwarting McClellan's attempt at capturing the Confederate capital and had neutralized the Army of the Potomac by driving it back to the safety of the Navy's gunboats on the James River. With McClellan no longer posing a threat to Richmond, Lee then turned his attention to another Union Army that had been gathering in Northern Virginia and placed under Major General John Pope. Lee hoped to crush Pope's army before it could be reinforced by McClellan's army which was already being withdrawn from the peninsula. During the final weeks of August, he did just that. In what many consider to be one of Lee's greatest victories, the Army of Northern Virginia soundly defeated Pope at the Second Battle Bull Run, or Second Manassas, and drove the shattered Union forces back to the safety of Washington's formidable defenses. McClellan's Army of the Potomac, which had arrived in time to help cover Pope's retreat, was also ordered to fall back to the nation's capital. With these two federal armies thus forced out of Virginia, and Lee's men emerging triumphant on one battlefield after another, the tide of war had suddenly turned in favor of the Confederacy. In just three months in command of the Army of Northern Virginia, General Robert E. Lee has succeeded in literally transferring the war from the gates of Richmond to the very outskirts of Washington. The optimism that prevailed in the North with the onset of spring is now replaced by the same gloom and despondency that characterized the Confederacy earlier that year. With Union forces now safely entrenched in Washington, Lee realizes that despite his army's string of battlefield successes, his men could ill afford to rest on their hard-earned laurels. No matter how worn out and exhausted they are, it is only early September, meaning there's still at least a month of campaign season left. Too early to go into winter quarters, Lee realizes he now has three strategic options before him. The first option is he can attack Washington DC with his army and attempt to siege or storm the federal capital and its formidable defenses. His second option 
favored by his trusted subordinate, James Longstreet, is to entrench his army in defensive positions all across Northern Virginia and wait for the enemy to resume his offensive, in which Lee could then soundly defeat him in another decisive battle like at Second Manassas. His third option, which is supported by Lee's other trusted senior most general, Stonewall Jackson, is to launch his own offensive into the north and force the enemy to pursue him on his own soil on Lee's terms. Lee merely blocks out any prospect of success in the first option. Washington is far too well defended and heavily fortified for his army to storm, and a prolonged siege of the Union's capital would never work with his army's tired condition and the potential rate of federal reinforcements that could arrive to relieve the capital. The second option is a good defensive strategy, but Lee does not wish to surrender his hard-fought initiative over to the Union Army just for them to resume an offensive against Richmond. By going on the defensive, he would have to react to Union movements and offensives. He knows that the Confederacy will be unable to win a defensive war against the overwhelming numbers of the Union, and that defensive strategies would just buy time at best. And so, Lee looks to his third option, an invasion of the North. On September 3rd, from his headquarters at Drainsville, Lee rides to President Jefferson Davis in Richmond. The present seems to be the most propitious time since the commencement of the war for the Confederate Army to enter Maryland. Lee's well aware of the risk involved in such a movement, especially considering the ragged condition of his army. He admits that it was not properly equipped for an invasion of an enemy's territory. It lacks much of the material war, is feeble in transportation, the animals being much reduced, and the men are poorly provided with clothes, and in thousand instances are destitute of shoes. Still, declared the Confederate Army commander, we cannot afford to be idle. There are five key points that factor into Lee's decision to invade the North. The first is logistics. A Confederate invasion of the North would provide much needed respite and relief for Virginia's farmers, who have suffered greatly during Union occupations in which Federal troops have raided their lands for food and supplies. By invading the North, Lee could give Virginia farmers time to regrow their crops and feed his half-starved army. Furthermore, by invading the North, Lee's troops could forage off untouched northern farmlands in Maryland and Pennsylvania in the Cumberland Valley. The second factor is military strategy. General Lee believes that McClellan's and Pope's armies lay weakened and demoralized in and around Washington, and so he seeks to maintain the aggressive momentum rather than go on the defensive and allow the Federals to muster their strength for another grand offensive on Richmond as previously mentioned. Lee believes he can easily outflank the Federals by crossing the Potomac upriver from Washington and marching the army in Northern Virginia through Maryland. Lee's army would have to remain in Northern Territory for a prolonged period of time, hopefully through the fall, which would give the general effect of a grand offensive rather than a simple week-long raid. Although not planned out or coordinated, Lee's army in Northern Virginia would be invading Maryland simultaneously with a Confederate Heartland offensive in the Western Theater an invasion of the state of Kentucky by General Braxton Bragg's Army of Mississippi. This is also in conjunction with smaller Confederate offensives into northeastern Mississippi by Major General Earl Van Dorn's Army of West Tennessee, which is targeting the Federal Rail Hub at Corinth, and resurgent Confederate forces in the Trans-Mississippi Theater launching attacks into southern Missouri. This uncoordinated Confederate Grand Offensive into Northern Territory during the late summer of 1862 is sometimes dubbed the Thousand Mile Front. Everywhere across the strategic board in September 1862, the Union is feeling the pressure of Confederate offensives. The third factor is the loyalty of the border states. At the outbreak of the Civil War in April 1861, the border state of Maryland was held virtually at gunpoint to remain in the Union. Through President Lincoln's Machiavellian tactics, Marylanders have been arrested and incarcerated without benefit of the right of habeas corpus, and 31 secessionist members of the Maryland State Legislature, along with the mayor of Baltimore, were thrown in prison for several weeks during the fall of 1861. All this the federal government had done to keep Maryland in the Union, despite much civil unrest in the state. General Lee and others in the Confederacy saw Maryland as being held hostage by the North. He and many Southern leaders believed that a Confederate offensive into Maryland would lead to military-aged men in the state flocking to the Confederate Army, 
and swelling the Army of Northern Virginia's ranks. This is the same viewpoint held by Bragg's forces in their own invasion of the border state of Kentucky. The fourth factor is diplomacy. Since the outbreak of the Civil War, the Confederacy had been hoping to gain at least diplomatic recognition from the great powers of Europe, specifically the empires of Great Britain and France. If the European powers could put pressure on the United States government to cease the naval blockade of the southern states, or possibly break the blockade themselves through threat of their powerful navies, it would potentially break the northern public's will to fight. If the armies of either or both Imperial powers join the Confederate forces in the field, or open a second front against the Union through British Canada or direct amphibious invasion, the tables of manpower and resources would be turned, and President Lincoln would have little choice but to accept Southern independence through a negotiated peace or military defeat of the North. Initially, Richmond used the South's main leverage over the Europeans, cheap cotton, the staple of each nation's textile industry to prod Britain and France toward breaking the Union naval blockade. When this failed after London deemed the blockade lawful, the Confederate government turned instead to a historic strategy that had been used successfully by the American patriots in the Revolutionary War 85 years earlier, diplomatic recognition as a first step to full military intervention. The best way to earn diplomatic recognition would be through winning a decisive military engagement much like the Patriots had achieved at the Battles of Saratoga in 1777, ultimately leading to French recognition of the United States and an eventual alliance against the British in that war. Initially, in the spring of 1862, Europe had seen the Confederacy on the brink of collapse. However, the results of Jackson's Valley Campaign and Lee's victory in repulsing McClellan's army from the gates of Richmond in the Seven Days Battles had reopened prospects for British and French recognition. Following the Battle of Second Manassas, hopes rise that one more decisive Southern victory, won on Northern soil, might finally gain the Confederacy its long-desired diplomatic recognition. At the same time, a Confederate continent embargo is beginning to hurt the British and French economies, throwing thousands out of work for lack of raw materials. In response, Local British and French press renewed pressure for London and Paris to intervene and end the war. French Emperor Napoleon III even tells Confederate envoy to Paris John Slidell that accounts of the defeat of the Federal armies before Richmond prove that re-establishment of the Union is impossible. Three days later, the Emperor sends a telegram directing his foreign minister, then visiting London, to ask the British government if they believe that time has come to intervene in the American Civil War. Although open support exists in both Britain and France for diplomatic recognition, it is viewed there mostly as a means to suit European objectives. British and French politicians welcome America's sectional divide, hoping that breaking the United States into two or more separate parts will preclude the emerging nation from competing with Europe's global strategic and economic dominance through imperialism. General Lee knows that European intervention in the Civil War would be purely motivated by their own national self-interest and personally tries to downplay the importance of European recognition or intervention towards achieving the South's independence. The fifth factor, arguably the most important in Lee's perspective, is politics. The United States is having a midterm election in November 1862. It is hoped by Lee that an invasion of Maryland or Pennsylvania might sag Northern public support for the Lincoln administration, leading to the election of Peace Democrats derisively known throughout the North as Copperhead Democrats, into the United States Congress. If the Peace Democrats could gain a majority of Congress, defeating the dominant Republican Party in the upcoming midterm election, it might lead to a negotiated peace with the South, which would ultimately lead to Southern independence. With these five factors in consideration, it is clear to see why Robert E. Lee decided to invade the state of Maryland in September 1862. With his decision made, Lee will begin making preparations for the invasion across the Potomac during the first week of the month. A 
A combination of panic and despair prevails throughout the North in the days immediately after the defeat at Second Bull Run. Whereas everything had seemed to be going so well for the Union War effort just a few months earlier. Now, with yet another defeat, things could hardly have appeared worse. The soldiers of two well-trained armies had been driven out of Virginia and now were falling back in much disorder to Washington, seeking the safety of the capital's extensive defenses. To many, it appears as though Lee's seemingly unstoppable army would no doubt fall on the hills of the retreating Union armies and attack Washington itself. Widespread alarm in the nation's capital sets in. Government offices are packed up, gunboats patrol the Potomac, and a steamer is anchored at the Washington Navy Yard, ready to transport President Lincoln and the members of his cabinet to some point farther north in case the capital should indeed come under attack. The soldiers trudging their way back to Washington are themselves much demoralized and the armies are in shambles. Without a doubt, these are some of the darkest days the Union will experience in the entire war. Fortunately, someone soon helps turn things around. 35-year-old George Brenton McClellan. He is the man who single-handedly reorganized and retrained the demoralized Union armies in the aftermath of the first debacle outside Manassas a year earlier. Yet despite this, his offensive against Richmond, the Peninsula Campaign, had ended in failure. To make matters worse, his refusal to cooperate with John Pope in the Northern Virginia Campaign helped lead to the latter's downfall at Second Bull Run. But for all his faults, George McClellan is precisely the man the United States needs in these dark days of early September 1862. On Tuesday, September 2nd, President Lincoln relieves John Pope and gives McClellan command of all the Union forces gathering in and around Washington. This includes not only his original Army of the Potomac, but also the troops who had served in Pope's Army of Virginia as well. The decision to reinstate McClellan as commanding general is by no means a popular one among Lincoln's cabinet, whose members largely despise a politically ambitious general. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton seeks in vain to get McClellan court-martialed, and Secretary of the Treasury Salmon P. Chase even goes so far as to declare that McClellan ought to be shot. The President, too, holds some reservations about McClellan, but realizes that the General's masterful organizational skills, as well as his ability to inspire confidence in the ranks, is exactly what is then most needed. To his young personal secretary, John Hay, Lincoln explains that there is no other General who can lick these troops of ours into shape half as well as McClellan. If he cannot fight himself, Lincoln says, he excels in making others ready to fight. McClellan immediately goes to work. With great energy, he soon succeeds in bringing order from the chaos that characterizes the Federal Army's fall in the lamentable summer of 1862, and his reinstatement to Army Command goes far in raising the morale of the demoralized Union troops. Indeed, when word spreads through the ranks that McClellan is back in command, the effect is immediate and electrical. No matter how unpopular he is with the Lincoln administration, George McClellan is simply beloved by his men. To Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells, Lincoln explains that he needs McClellan because he has the army with him, and he is right. Within a matter of days, McClellan reorganizes the Union forces and combines them into a single powerful army. Pope's former Army of Virginia is incorporated into McClellan's Army of the Potomac. McDowell's former Third Corps is reinstated with its original title as the First Corps. Siegel's 1st Corps of predominantly German Americans become the Army's new 11th Corps, and Banks' old 2nd Corps is transformed into the 12th Corps. To lead the 1st Corps, McClellan replaces Irving McDowell with a very aggressive and highly capable Major General Joseph Hooker. He keeps Franz Siegel at the head of the 11th Corps, but will leave them, along with Heintzelman's 3rd Corps, behind to man Washington's defenses while the rest of the Army sets out to pursue Lee's Confederate forces. Nathaniel P. Banks retains command of 12th Corps for two weeks, but McClellan eventually has him reassigned to take command of the capital's defenses. Ultimately, McClellan will replace him with Major General Joseph K. F. Mansfield as the head of the 12th Corps on September 15th. McClellan retains the commanding generals of the 2nd, 5th, and 6th Corps, which have served under him during the Peninsula Campaign in Seven Days Battles. Respectively, these men are Major Generals Edwin B. Bull Sumner, Fitz John Porter, and William B. Franklin. 
The Rafashion Army of the Potomac is further augmented by Major General Ambrose E. Burnside's IX Corps, which had served under Pope at Second Bull Run, but was never officially part of that army. McClellan also has to deal with scores of brand new regiments, many of which have been recruited early in the summer and are only now just arriving in the capital. Furthermore, many new regiments recruited for nine month enlistment periods arrived to reinforce McClellan, having been raised over the past few weeks in the current state of emergency facing the Union war effort. These regiments are filled with green and experienced troops, some so new to army life they haven't even had the chance to fire their recently issued muskets. McClellan disperses these largely undertrained and entirely inexperienced regiments among his veteran brigades. It is perhaps McClellan's greatest achievement of the war, his shining hour. In less than a week, Lillimac has been able to effectively reorganize the highly disordered and demoralized Union forces in Washington and restore his soldiers' confidence and morale. No one else would have been able to effect this turnaround so quickly and thoroughly. When reports begin arriving in Washington on Thursday, September 4th, of the Confederate invasion of Maryland, McClellan and the Army of the Potomac are ready to face him in the Eastern Theater's last major campaign of summer, 1862.